Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. We're really delighted to have you here, and we're very delighted to welcome Foreign Minister McCulley. Uh, everything I've heard so far is that, uh, that this has been a very successful visit. And uh, uh, I think it just reflects a sentiment that we all feel that uh, it's about time. You know, we've had a long period between our two countries where there was such a, a, a natural opportunity for us to work together, but we couldn't find a way to do it. And we're finally getting over all of that. And it's really encouraging uh, that we have it. I, it, I, I think it predated uh, the tragic earthquake that uh, New Zealand experienced, but it brought us all so much closer together. Uh, we had a, a delegation through uh, Ambassador Moore's good offices, we had a major delegation in Christchurch when that happened, and uh, nothing brings you closer together than this, and it just cemented a commitment that we have to each other, and I think that's been reflected by the spirit that Foreign Minister McCulley has received in coming, but it's also been a, a, a long overdue rapprochement. You know, I, uh, I was up in Capitol Hill when it started going sour, you know. And it was really two governments that took us in that way. It wasn't two peoples. And, but it takes a while sometimes to overcome that. And all of a sudden you stop and say, well, why are we mad at each other? I mean, I can't remember. And uh, <laughs> so let's get on with the new world. And the new world is one where there's so much where we will benefit together, mutually, we'll benefit by working closely with each other, and I'm so glad that I've lived long enough to see this happen. And so, Foreign Minister, we will turn to you for your remarks, and then my colleague, Dr. Mike Green, is going to keep this terribly indisciplined group in control to ask decent questions of you. Please help me welcome Foreign Minister McCarthy. Thank you very much, and um, can, I, can I just reflect on those sentiments uh, very briefly. If you are ever planning to have a tragic earthquake, um, you should always make sure that you've got a high-level delegation of Americans in town. Um, because um, from uh, the, uh, the sense of um, shared uh, threat and tragedy that arose from the earthquake, uh, there has been an amazing outpouring of generosity from the American people, led by those who were present uh, in many cases in, in, in Christchurch uh, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to put on record the enormous appreciation of the New Zealand government and New Zealand people for the uh, not just the, the warmth uh, and good wishes that flowed our way but the material assistance and in particular I want to mention the uh, American Friends of Christchurch who have um, made such a material contribution to support those who need help uh, in Christchurch at the moment. I, I want to mention in particular Dr Peter Watson, uh, whose work in this respect uh, is, uh, is greatly appreciated. Um, you may have heard, uh, those of you who know that uh, Dr Watson and I uh, do know each other, that we were in the same class at law school. That is only partly true. We were enrolled in the same class. I was off playing politics most of the time, and as, as evidenced by his subsequent career, he attended the lectures and learnt something. <laughs> Um, but I, uh, I just wanted to say, um, Peter and Didi, how much we appreciate um, the leadership that you've brought to uh, this, uh, this particular American Friends of Christchurch group and the generosity that American people have shown to us. So can I just please put that on the record? Uh, and in the, the other um, introductory comment I just wanted to reflect on is the uh, fact that it, where there have been differences, they have not been differences between two peoples. And the acid test for that, uh, uh, from my perspective, was when we deci decided to, to try and do few th a few things in New Zealand that we thought would make the relationship work better, there were some who thought, well, uh, there's a latent anti-Americanism or something that's driven uh, this attitude in New Zealand over a period of time, and I've never believed that. And anyone who saw Hillary Clinton's visit to New Zealand uh, last November uh, would have seen the evidence. She was given the rock star treatment uh, in New Zealand. Even in, in the function I hosted at Parliament, it, it, it was uh, amazing to see um, significant members of our community, leaders of our community, um, uh, give her the rock star treatment in that way, and it told me a good deal about the uh, sentiment that exists between the two peoples, as you say, and uh, 
and we're very pleased to have the opportunity as policy makers to build upon that. Uh, I want to um, thank you uh, indeed for the opportunity to say a few words about some key features of our foreign policy and in particular some of the areas in which those foreign policy interests intersect. I'm in uh, Washington this week to continue the wide-ranging dialogue between New Zealand and the United States uh, about the areas where we can work together. I met uh, with the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton yesterday. We discussed the progress that we'd made since November when we signed the so-called Wellington Declaration, which was about establishing a framework within which we could cooperate more generally, but also specifically that we could make our partnership more effective uh, in the uh, Pacific. The topics we discussed ranged from Afghanistan, where we're working shoulder to shoulder, to challenges in the Middle East and North Africa, and of course to the growing engagement of your country uh, in uh, Asia, and particularly through the East Asia Summit, something I'll say something about uh, uh, in a minute. But it's clear from the discussions that um, uh, we've had, and we've had a wide range of discussions in the space of a day and a half, that there is a very strong sense of partnership emerging on a number of different fronts. Our small South Pacific country uh, has its heritage deeply rooted in Europe. Uh, our values and principles are, strong, are strongly focused around the rule of law, human rights, and a commitment to democratic institutions, uh, and these are deeply embedded uh, in our thinking. They are a basis for the strong sense of alignment we therefore have with US uh, foreign policy, and uh, it's why we work together on a range of issues that cause the world so much difficulty. But in other respects, despite that, that, um, uh, those origins, uh, New Zealand is defined by its geography. Our economic prospects are deeply intertwined with those of the rapidly growing economies of Asia, yet both our makeup and our geography give us an increasing involvement in and responsibility for the future stability and security of the Pacific. I often refer, refer to the former, the uh, Asian region, as our zone of opportunity, and the latter, latter as our zone of responsibility. In both of these two respects, we see dynamic, evolving situations in which the growing sense of alignment between our two countries should see us working increasingly closely together. New Zealand's relationship with its closest neighbour, Australia, is both our greatest asset and our greatest challenge. For 30 years, our two countries have enjoyed probably the world's most complete free trade deal, and the massive degree of economic integration that's uh, happened has been overwhelmingly positive for the New Zealand economy. At the same time, the fact that our people and capital have complete freedom of movement to Australia represents a constant challenge. Unless New Zealand can present opportunities that are the equal of those available across the Tasman, both our capital and our skills will gradually migrate there. The fact that we live on the edge of the Asia-Pacific region at a time that is widely regarded as the Asia-Pacific century is our big opportunity. And the architecture now in place, and now being put in place, should provide a strong basis for pursuing this opportunity. We were the first developed nation to conclude a free trade deal with China, and our exports have doubled in the three years that the FTA has been in operation, with China now moving past the US as our second largest trading partner behind Australia. Ratifications just being completed of the FTA between the CER partners, that's New Zealand and Australia, and ASEAN, creating a market of over 600 million people, including economies like Vietnam and Indonesia, big countries in our terms growing at an excess of 7%. So uh, we are in also in FTA discussions with Korea and with India, and we're very close to concluding a free trade agreement with Russia. But it is the prospect of the Trans-Pacific Partnership bringing the uh, possibility of a single Pacific market, including the US and New Zealand, along with other Pacific Rim countries, that holds the best promise of a game-changing initiative in our wider region. And it's here that economic leadership from our two countries is important to the TPP proposal succeeding. And can I say I've been greatly heartened by the positive sentiments, quite determined sentiments, that I've heard around Washington uh, in respect of the TPP over the last uh, day and a half. But it's not just in the area of trade that our two countries are able to cooperate 
in relation to the economies of Asia. This year, the US joins the East Asia Summit, an organisation that New Zealand's been a party to since its inception. We very much welcome this initiative on the US part, which will bring that body much closer to becoming the regional clearinghouse on matters of regional security, trade, economic and disaster management cooperation. The character of US participation in the EAS later this year will have a key influence over the shape of regional architecture for some time ahead. And it's been very valuable here in Washington to secure a closer understanding of how that process is seen by the United States. We, New Zealand, are very keen to play a very constructive role here. US interests in Asia and the US determination to engage more actively in the region will see our two countries work more closely together in the years immediately ahead. But it's in relation to our involvement in the Pacific neighbourhood that I wanted to focus most of my comments today. When it comes to the Pacific, our two countries have much in common. New Zealand's a country comprised of two large Pacific islands. The United States has one state, Hawaii, and three territories, Guam, uh, the Northern Marianas, and American Samoa, which are also islands sitting in the Pacific Ocean. And just as New Zealand has special constitutional relationships with the Cook Islands, Tokelau and Niue, the same is true of the United States and the three compact states of, in the North Pacific, Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. In September of this year, the 16 nations of the Pacific Forum, including Australia and New Zealand, will hold the 40th anniversary in Auckland, coincidentally on the same week as the opening game of the Rugby World Cup being hosted in New Zealand. Uh, in fact, on the post-forum dialogue will occur on the same day as the opening match between the All Blacks and Tonga. So uh, it was an occasion uh, that we wanted to take full advantage of. I welcome the opportunity for New Zealand to host this milestone meeting because the government of which I'm a member has attempted to sharply elevate our focus on our own role within the region. In the past week, I've been to both Tonga and the Cook Islands. Over the next few weeks, I'll be in the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Niue, and probably Fiji, and probably also in the Cook Islands and Tonga again. Um, I say probably Fiji because that is a visit that is planned as a member of the ministerial contact group of the forum in relation to uh, Fiji's forum status, and that meeting is yet to be confirmed. The reason we're so focused on New Zealand's role in the region is simple. We are, in a population sense, very much part of the Pacific region. Let me illustrate my point. There are now a little over 170,000 Samoans living in Samoa. There are over 130,000 uh, Samoans living uh, in New Zealand. There are just over 100,000 Tongans living in Tonga and over 50,000 Tongan New Zealanders. Uh, in relation to the realm states, uh, the, the uh, equation is a little different because those people have, as New Zealand citizens, a free right of access to New Zealand. So uh, in respect of the Cook Islands, there are 60,000 Cook Islanders uh, living in New Zealand and 12,500 remaining in the Cooks. In relation to Niue, there are 22,000 Niueans living in New Zealand and only 1,000 on a good day living in Niue. So I, I hope I illustrate my point that we are a very much a part of the Pacific region. Uh, there has been substantial migration uh, to New Zealand and uh, there is now a complex web of family and other connections uh, between New Zealanders and uh, other citizens of our region. These equip our country in a unique way to play a role as a regional facilitator, especially in our own part of the Pacific, which of course is Polynesia. These uh, features give us a capacity to deliver to our partnership with Australia and the region a level of engagement that compensates to some extent for our relative lack of size and budget. And, and we are very focused on this reality at a time when Australia is dramatically increasing its ODA spend from about $4.5 billion to $8 billion, uh, some of which will find its way into the region. And for New Zealand uh, to uh, add real value, uh, Without the same size checkbook, we have to become more effective facilitators, more effective managers within the region if we're going to give value, and we are very intent on doing so. So for New Zealand, hosting the 40th meeting of Pacific leaders is an opportunity for us to advance an agenda 
that we believe is critical to the future viability of the region and its members. I want to mention just three areas in particular, which I hope to see our co in, in respect of which I hope to see our cooperation enhanced in the immediate future. First, uh, I want to say that we very much welcome the fact that USAID will again become a presence in the Pacific region, and we understand perfectly the challenges of ha having a coordinated presence uh, around the Pacific. Um, between New Zealand and Australia, we are developing an almost instinctive capacity to avoid duplication. So in some cases, that means that we simply hand a cheque to the Australians and say, hey, we want to be part of your program in places like Nauru, and that's how it works in respect of the Cook Islands and Niue. They do th the same with us. I'd like to think that between the two trans-Tasman partners, we could offer the opportunity for partnerships that would ensure that the US could establish a strong and visible development presence in the region, relying substantially on our facilitation skills. Um, I want to uh, perhaps say in relation to this that um, we have as a government made some changes to our policy uh, in terms of the, the aid uh, side of the shop. Uh, uh, the aid function used to be a separate uh, uh, agency. It has now been brought back inside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's now a division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was responsible for leading the charge on this because I wanted uh, total alignment between Dip diplomatic and development functions, and it seemed to me when you're a small player with a, not a very big budget, and when you're intent on doing important game-changing things in your own region, then you simply can't, can't afford to have a lack of alignment between your diplomatic and development roles, uh, and so we've uh, uh, brought those two together. Uh, we've allocated a significantly increased size of the budget to the Pacific side of our work, and will continue to do so at the same time as uh, resisting budget, budget pressures to, uh, to cut the, the development budget, uh, we have managed to maintain it. And so uh, in addition to stepping up our work in places like the Cook Islands, um, uh, Tonga and Samoa, we've increased our budgets by about 40 per cent in the couple of years I've been in this job. In each of those cases, we were able to turn to um, high priority areas like uh, Tarawa and Kiribati, and if any of you have been, have been there recently, you'll know that presents one of the biggest development challenges in our region, uh, where you've got humanitarian uh, issues that you might expect to find in some parts of uh, more difficult parts of Africa. Uh, we are intent on making uh, a serious difference there. We were spending about $3 million a year in Kiribati. When I took this job on, we'll spend $30 million there next year. And we're working really hard to leverage the uh, Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. And I think we've got about $77 million worth of partnerships out of our work with them in the last, um, in the last few months. And I say that to illustrate that we are very intent on uh, playing an increased uh, role ourselves within the region, and we want to see that as a base for enha enhanced cooperation and hopefully um, for, um, for really strong partnerships between USAID, New Zealand and Australia uh, in our region. Second, in relation to governance, I think we need to acknowledge that there are, um, remain significant challenges for us to deal with in our own region. Political instability has sadly become too great a feature of too many Pacific nations. And that's one of the reasons we simply need to stand fairly firm on Fiji. Uh, I'll be quite clear about this, that um, uh, Fiji is not the only country in the Pacific that could find itself being run by a military dictatorship if that sort of behaviour was to become acceptable or fashionable within our region. Uh, and I'm not going to go naming names. I simply say that um, if you're a glass-half-empty sort of guy, uh, looking at the changes of government and... Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the fragility of governments across the region, uh, it wouldn't be too hard to cry yourself to sleep at night. Uh, it, it, there are challenges there uh, driven by political instability, and, uh, and, and I think we need to be very joined up in the way in which we deal with those. And here can I say that uh, the approach that uh, Dr Kurt Campbell uh, has brought to uh, the maintenance of relations in, uh, in the Pacific has been absolutely first class. Uh, we have very frequent, very direct, very meaningful communications in this area, and our countries work very closely together. So we need uh, to find a, a, an active, uh, there's, there's a need for active, complementary diplomacy and development work from New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. 
uh, focusing on improving governance across our region. I think we also need to uh, say to some of our other partners who are active in the development world within our region that we want them to work more closely with us as well. And I uh, say quite directly that um, uh, an ongoing conversation I have with the Chinese government is the, uh, our strong desire for them to join us in partnership and some development work within the region and also for them to work with us uh, in relation to governance uh, issues in the region. The third point is that there are two sectors in particular that call for a strong and immediate focus in terms of our development programs. Firstly, the provision of renewable energy, and secondly, the management of the region's fishery stocks. All of the smaller Pacific nations are being hammered by the cost of imported diesel for the purpose of generating electricity. In some cases, they're paying two or three times what you would pay for diesel in the United States. For many, it represents arguably the largest single strain on their economies. Many, many reports have been written uh, by consultants about renewable energy within the Pacific, uh, yet little has been done to introduce renewable energy into the region. There have been some spasmodic attempts, but on, on a serious scale, it just hasn't happened. Leading up to the Pacific uh, Forum Leaders Meeting later this year, I hope that this is something that we can change, uh, and that is a statement of intent. Uh, we are working very hard to try and make sure that we get practical projects uh, planned, designed and off the ground, and that we ha start having conversations with prospective partners. Um, the Pacific badly needs, for both environmental and economic reasons, uh, renewable energy in large doses over the next couple of years. It would be a game changer for many of the small Pacific nations and uh, New Zealand is determined to lead the charge uh, and work with development partners to achieve this. The fisheries resource of the Pacific represents the largest single economic asset for some of the poorest countries that we have uh, in the region. And if I could go back to Kiribati as an example again, a country that's got uh, arguably uh, the biggest challenges of most types within our region. They have uh, an EEZ, an exclusive economic zone, that is just over 3.5 million square kilometres, which is colossal. I mean, New Zealand thinks it's got a large EEZ at, I think, about 2.2 million square kilometres. So this is a large economic asset for a country like Kiribati. But as is the case um, with so many Pacific countries, they see uh, too little benefit for this resource in terms of the direct return uh, to the owners. Across the 14 Pacific nations that are members of the forum, last year around $2 billion worth of fish was taken out of their collective zone. Uh, estimates I've seen start at about $400 million and work up from there in terms of illegal and unreported catch. Now, that is a lot of wealth to go disappearing out of the hands of some people who don't have very much to start with, in excess of $400 million a year in unlawful fishing. So um, that is something we need to do something about. At the moment, uh, the US Tuna Treaty hangs in the balance. It's an area where we want to work with the US administration. There needs to be a fair return provided to the Pacific Island countries for resources that are taken from the EEZ and enhanced opportunities for their participation in the fishery. But we also recognise that it needs to happen on terms that will secure the continued presence of the United States in uh, the fishery. It's important to us in the context of our own development objectives and uh, the overall upgrade of fisheries management in the region that we work together to achieve this. My point here is that some collective work from partners uh, to ensure improved fisheries management better surveillance, training of observers and monitors, and training of Pacific people for employment in the fishery sector could materially improve economic outcomes for many Pacific countries. And to go back to the Kiribati example, uh, we're trying to secure a better approach to the management of the fishery. We're trying to uh, uh, step up the surveillance work we do. We're trying to ensure that we uh, upgrade the fisheries training centre so that they can insist that they have a certain number of people on the boats that are trained in the centre uh, and, and more directly participate uh, in, their own, uh, in their own fisheries business. New Zealand's currently the largest provider of aerial surveillance uh, of um, 
uh, Pacific country EEZs, and the rollout of our new offshore patrol vessels uh, will ensure a significant increase in New Zealand's surface patrolling of the Pacific from this year. It's an area where we want to work more closely with the United States, and I've raised this in a number of my meetings while I've been here in Washington, with the uh, US Coast Guard. Uh, we're looking to step up our engagement uh, and uh, through the uh, Coast Guard's Oceania Maritime Security Initiative, which I understand is undertaken in conjunction with uh, the, uh, uh, some of the, the uh, government agency partners here, we want to enhance cooperation. Again, it's an area where you can see that collective action um, from the forum should emerge later this year. So I hope that we will face up to the fact that there are uh, still very substantial challenges for us to confront uh, in the Pacific region. There are uh, issues affecting both the environmental and economic sustainability of our region that cry out for attention, and there are areas in which New Zealand and the United States have got a shared interest in ensuring that we make progress quickly. Uh, I, I want to close my remarks by underlining just how seriously we take our commitment to the Pacific region, how highly we regard US engagement in the region, how much we want to be uh, in partnership with the United States because we think we can materially change the future for some people who live uh, as our neighbours and increasingly in New Zealand's case our family uh, who are uh, capable of having their lot in life improved very substantially if we all work together. So these are significant challenges but they're challenges uh, that we wish to see us attack together. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, thank you uh, very much indeed for a um, <coughs> compelling and strategic and comprehensive presentation. Um, I'm uh, uh, pleased and honored to serve as uh, the um, convener for the Q&A session. Um, I must confess I'm a little bit jealous. I was the senior uh, Asia official in the National Security Council staff under President Bush, and we made progress on some of these issues, but we never um, quite got uh, over the goal line. Uh, in the way that uh, my friend Kurt Campbell is uh, doing in partnership with your government today. And Kurt's a good friend, so I, so I won't be too jealous. But um, uh, we never quite had the stars aligned quite right. It wasn't just, frankly, uh, five, six years ago, Wellington and Washington. There was a broader regional context. Uh, Canberra's uh, views mattered on this. To Tokyo's views mattered enormously. Um, the stars are aligning in a way that uh, there's progress now and, and that there's very, very broad recognition of what, what we saw uh, and I think that people saw uh, at the end of the Clinton administration that this is not just a sort of a la carte relationship. It's indispensable um, as we try to work um, in the same direction to create, in particular, an Asia-Pacific architecture that's inclusive and open, but is also um, creating a community based on norms and rules, not just membership. And we have basically identical views on that and can't achieve that without each other. Um, I also want to echo your... Um, uh, comments on Peter Watson, um, who has been with the Friends of Christ Church, um, playing uh, 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 both in a you know indispensable but really um, quite inspiring role in U.S.-New Zealand relations. So much so that um, uh, I have copied his example. We at CSIS have created a task force to help Japan on recovery, and Peter has been helping to uh, export or import uh, to us ideas based on what he's doing with the Friends of Christ Church. So thank you, Peter. It's been and very important. We should. We should. We should. <laughs> um, uh, there was a lot uh, in the speech. There, there are, uh, are aspects of the relationship people may want to go into further. The intelligence and defense relationships. One thing that's, that that stood out for me in particular was the minister's suggestion that New Zealand might find opportunities to dialogue with Beijing about um, development assistance to the Pacific Islands. Um, I think this is an area of, uh, of both opportunity and concern. Um, the fragile states, the governance issues can be significantly hurt or helped by Beijing's uh, attitude towards development. I would add to that Taipei's. I think um, uh, from a personal perspective, Taiwan has an important role uh, in terms of development in that region. We ought to find ways um, uh, to dialogue with Taipei as well. But I was struck in particular that you are, are trying this out. We in the U.S. have had very limited success on development dialogues with China. Um, it's not necessarily intent, it's that their development uh, bureaucracy is scattered 
and there's no central control, and it's very hard to have a strategic dialogue about aid in that circumstance. But I was struck by that because um, New Zealand, the first FDA with China by a developed uh, OECD country, uh, may be in a pivotal position to start testing that prospect that we can work with Beijing to improve governance and development in the Pacific Islands. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one question and then open it up to the floor. Um, I was struck by your remarks also about the East Asia Summit. I'd be curious how you view the broader architecture. Um, APEC is uh, a little bit important to us this year. Uh, I'm sure it is to you as well. Uh, architecture is a misnomer. Architecture suggests intelligent design, beauty. What we have in East Asia is uh, an overgrown garden of often competing and often redundant our, uh, our institutions. I've worked in the White House. I've seen the president's schedule. It's very, very hard to get the president of the United States to take what is essentially a week of time. It will now, in most years, be two weeks. Um, so um, my old White House staff personality tells me we've got to make this EAS worthwhile. We've got to figure out what the future of APIC is. I wonder if I could start with a question about how you see the overall evolution of regional architecture. Uh, there's talk of aligning APEC and ARF. Are we just going to have to live with this confused pluralism and diversity and play our game on every front? Or are there prospects to um, rationalize or bring together more cohesion to the regional institution building? Let me start with that question, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Do, would you like to? Um, the answer to your two questions is yes and yes. Um, I think that um, uh, we are going to have to work with, uh, with the program that is there to start with. Um, but, but there are real opportunities for rationalisation. Uh, how we go about that is going to be very important. Uh, simply telling ASEAN that um, you, you want to rearrange their, uh, their program is not uh, uh, likely to guarantee too much success. Um, working in a consultative fashion uh, is, is uh, something that uh, can be effective over a period of time. And, and I have been quite focused on this uh, in my visit to Washington simply because uh, we are engaged in discussions now that will shape the agenda for the first uh, EAS, EAS meeting in which um, uh, the US will be involved. Uh, we've got uh, a, a few weeks in which to, to, to try and uh, influence the course of that. The chair of uh, ASEAN Indonesia have been quite open in seeking New Zealand's views on that topic, and I've been in turn been anxious to understand what is going to work for the United States uh, so that uh, we can contribute uh, to a process of ensuring uh, a, a good structure. If it's not going to, if it's not going to ca capture U.S. attention, it's not going to work for us either. There's no point in uh, in, in us uh, uh, supporting, as we actively have, the uh, engagement of the U.S. and the EAS without uh, ensuring that it's going to uh, maintain your uh, interest and engagement. Uh, I think that. Um, there are some obvious uh, steps that can be taken to rationalise the, the, the very substantial program, and I think those things will happen over the, ca the course of two or three years, four or five years, if we approach this in a constructive manner. Uh, and uh, uh, I, th I think there are one or two issues around uh, with the way in which the ASEAN chair will move over the next couple of years, which will make that more challenging for us. But New Zealand's prepared to put its shoulder to the wheel and try and... Uh, play a constructive uh, role here. So uh, we, uh, we, we think that uh, it's all doable. We think it's great that the US is on board, uh, and, uh, and we want to make sure it works for you as well as for the rest of us. Thank you. Um, I'll ask people to raise your hands and um, identify yourselves, except for the first person who I will call on and identify, Ernie Bauer, who runs our Southeast Asia <coughs> program and has really um, injected an enormous amount of energy here at CSIS into um, strengthening US-New Zealand relations. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mr. Minister, welcome to uh, CSIS. I wanted to follow up a bit on Mike's question and ask specifically about the way, uh, and I realize it's sort of related to your area of responsibility, but shared with your uh, colleague, the Minister of Defense. Uh, how is New Zealand thinking about maritime security in the Asia Pacific region? And I think that's, if you've been consulting with the White House and and um, the State Department and Defense Department. I'm sure you've heard a little bit about concerns about maritime security. Um, could you share uh, New Zealand's view on, on that issue and, and in the context, perhaps, of, uh, of the upcoming uh, ARF and the EAS? Thank yeah. You. Well, uh, suffice to say, I think we're on, New Zealand and the U.S. are 
very much on the same page uh, in that respect in terms of our objectives. And I think we've got uh, a range of opportunities to uh, explore those, uh, uh, those objectives. Um, we've certainly got an appetite for seeing maritime security issues on the agenda for uh, EAS discussion. Uh, we, of course, participate in the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, ADM Plus meetings and so on. And uh, we think that uh, uh, the EAS format will, should lend itself to, to, uh, to pursuit of uh, good objectives in the uh, maritime security area. I think that um, there are a, ba a bundle of other uh, topics that uh, will reinforce these objectives, for example, uh, if we can get a, and Kevin Rudd's been actively promoting uh, this uh, outcome, uh, focus on uh, regional uh, disaster management capabilities and so on, which gets our, our people in uniforms uh, working together in a soft way, uh, doing exercises and, and so on. I think it's, th these are, are good ways of moving ourselves forward and enhancing relations um, uh, with, with, with countries like China, uh, uh, through through those means. Priscilla Huff, Radio New Zealand. Um, is there something the U.S. agenda is huge? Is there something that you feel or message you've brought that you would like the U.S. to pay more attention to? You've kind of hinted at that about the fisheries, but the, is there something you feel coming from the region that you, sh you know, the U.S. You, Washington you need to pay more attention to this? No, I, I don't. I've got to say that um, uh, the uh, interactions we've had here, <coughs> as on previous occasions, have shown the U.S. Uh, administration to be highly attentive um, and uh, uh, to um, to have the. Uh, if I might just illustrate the point in, in general terms, we had a visit from Secretary Clinton uh, in uh, in November of last year. Um, I was invited to come back to maintain the momentum of those discussions uh, uh, here. Uh, which we have done, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Secretary of State yesterday made the point that the President Obama was looking forward to a visit from uh, Prime Minister Key before the end of the, the summer here. I mean, <coughs> that shows a level of attention to New Zealand and New Zealand's agenda that um, we can hardly complain about. Uh, but I, 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 do, I did make the point in my uh, prepared remarks uh, about both fisheries uh, a, a policy and uh, renewable energy, because uh, with the USAID re-engagement uh, in our region, uh, there are obviously some. Uh, there's obviously some consideration uh, here into what the priority areas might be. I'm uh, mirroring in a public way what I've been saying privately uh, uh, for some time about the priority that I personally and, and our government places on those two areas. They are profoundly important. Uh, and, and we can make progress quite quickly if we work together. And I'm hopeful that, um, uh, and I'm not asking for, for uh, the USAID budget to, to all go on to, to those two objectives. I simply want to make sure that they're held up high as areas where uh, New Zealand's giving them priority and where we hope the forum uh, leaders will give them priority later this year. Hi, how are you? Connie Lawn for yeah. Scoop NZ and others. Welcome back. Uh, two things. Do you think in light of this nuclear disaster in Japan, the U.S. is finally ready to drop its silly nuclear prejudice against New Zealand? And also, are you satisfied with the amount of intelligence sharing with the United States, if you can talk about that? I knew you'd ask me petsy questions. Yes, naturally, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, uh, look, um, I think that um, uh, th there are political ramifications all around the world from what's happened in Japan. You just need to look at the elections um, in Germany recently to see uh, that the way in which political parties deal with uh, uh, the uh, nuclear energy debate uh, is profoundly important. Uh, but I don't think there are any particular messages for the New Zealand-US relationship in that sense. We're very comfortable uh, that, um, that we've got a strong platform uh, for the relationship, and uh, as I've, I hope I've just said, um, we couldn't be happier with the, uh, the, the level of engagement that we have. Um, sorry, the second part of your question was... Intelligence. Oh, yeah, intelligence, yeah. Well, um, I've got um, 
Uh, I've got to go to the non-aligned movement um, meeting in uh, Bali next week. I'm dropping through with some of the officials and I've just collected some, uh, some cufflinks from various agencies around the town to swap around with my, my normal ones. No, look, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy uh, with the level of intelligence uh, that we've got uh, being swapped uh, between our various agencies and for New Zealand to draw the value that we do from uh, from, from that relationship is fantastic and in return we are determined to give value uh, uh, from, from our own work. Uh, Mutaya, could you speak clearly into the Minister's cufflink <laughs> when you ask your question? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mutaya Lagapa with the East West Centre. Uh, Minister, I um, noted two key words. You said opportunity, you looked at Asia and you said opportunity and looked at Pacific and you said responsibility. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to follow the responsibility part of this um, and, and ask you, what do you see as New Zealand's responsibility in the Pacific? Uh, you did lay out some challenges and uh, stability, uh, development and so forth. But even more basic than that, what do you see is in fact the responsibility of New Zealand uh, towards the Pacific region? Uh, I think that um, I very much see uh, our role as one of having responsibility in the region. We're one of... Um, uh, two uh, local countries that make a significant contribution to the overall development budget in the region. And as I say, because our, our uh, checkbook is smaller than that of our Australian friends, uh, we feel an obligation to give uh, better value for money in terms of the uh, facilitation work we, we can achieve in the region. Uh, I think we are uniquely placed to do that because of the complex web of family relationships that I spoke about. Uh, I think that uh, because, because we have that strong Pacifica influence in New Zealand and the strong indigenous Maori influence in New Zealand, there is a New Zealand style that many of our people can bring to work in the region that is not especially threatening, uh, which is uh, consultative uh, and, and which is um, uh, constructive. And uh, so I, I do believe that we are well equipped to be able to facilitate projects, to uh, undertake work in delicate areas like governance and the rule of law, which um, where it's inherently difficult to communicate good messages in a way that doesn't appear condescending. So uh, I, I think for all of those re uh, reasons, um, New Zealand uh, has a responsibility to, uh, to lead a significant amount of the development work within the region. We've got a responsibility to lead the work on governance uh, in particular. Uh, I think we've got a responsibility to ensure that the money is well spent. And here I make no apology for saying that I'm taking quite a tough line on regional organisations where uh, I think it's very easy to go and dump a cheque uh, into uh, a regional fund and say, well, we've discharged our responsibility. I think instead New Zealand's got to be the first country to say, we question whether we're getting value for money out of uh, that size of commitment uh, to a particular fund, um, and we need to ask ourselves whether we could spend that money more effectively bilaterally. Uh, that is the test that we need to keep applying. If we're going to change the future for people in our region, we, we need to make some tough calls about those things. Minister, if I could briefly follow up on that, in particular how we leverage our own aid resources to strengthen governance. Um, and democracy in, in the Pacific Island states, and at a time when there are other sources of money pouring in that are not yeah. at all tied. Um, and you mentioned the need for dialogue with Beijing. I think everyone would agree. But what about opportunities to do, if not donor coordination, you know, more strategic dialogue with countries like Japan, which is shifting a bit more towards governance in its budget, and Korea, which is a DAC country now increasing, or even Indonesia, yeah. which is hosting the Bali Democracy Forum, which is not which includes countries like Syria, so it's a, <laughs> it, it has its limitations, but nevertheless, it's part of their foreign policy personality. Are there opportunities to broaden this a bit beyond? Because, of course, we and you and Australia have a particular history with these countries that might limit what we can do. I, I think it's um, not just an opportunity, it's a responsibility we have uh, to, to work harder in this area. And uh, uh, you're quite right, Jap Japan is a very significant donor within the region. I'll be going there. Uh, in the latter part of next week, and we've already arranged some of our conversations to focus on precisely this point. We want to have a much more structured relationship uh, with Japan, uh, and uh, without getting into specifics, um, uh, that means, ne means we need to be a bit flexible in some respects. For example, some of Japan's funding is, um, is, is tagged to, uh, to their own 
uh, technologies providing, for example, renewable energy solutions. Well, we're not going to get bent out of shape about that. Um, uh, if, um, if, if joining a partnership with Japan requires us to commit to their technology and its world-class technology, um, well, we should, we should be flexible enough to try and make that sort of thing work, and, and that's uh, something we, we are intent on doing. With regard to China, um, it is going to be a, 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 a drawn-out process, but uh, we, we were thought to be um, friendly enough and, and possibly small enough to, have, um, to be given the opportunity to have a f the first free trade deal that ch uh, China had with a, uh, de a developed country. Uh, uh, we should therefore be best placed to be the first country with which they decide to undertake development uh, partnerships. And I'm going to go on asking uh, and proposing uh, until it starts to happen, and I think, I think it will happen. I honestly think we will make that step quite soon. Uh, in relation to, can I just pick up your earlier comments uh, in relation to Taiwan? Um, uh, that, is, that is more difficult in some ways, uh, but uh, yes, um, important player in the region. You know, and when you think, of, think about it this, in these terms, China now has more diplomats in the Pacific than New Zealand and Australia combined, okay? And there are six of the forum countries, six of the 14 forum countries in the Pacific that they don't even recognize. Um, you know, there are, uh, there are, there are six countries that, uh, that, uh, that recognize Taiwan. Um, so, um, yeah, they're, they're an important player. In a place like Solomon Islands, for example, which recognizes Taiwan, um, New Zealand and Australia are spending a quarter of a billion dollars a year between us uh, to try and stop people killing each other. Um, and we've largely achieved that in recent years, and now the trick is to try and find a way of scaling that budget down with people still not killing each other. Um, but again, this, I hope this will be one area where we can partner uh, USAID, because um, uh, the US has got a huge history with Guadalcanal from World War II and Tarawa, and I hope we can do the same thing there, and then reach out to other donors and say, hey, we've, we've, we've agreed to do these things on these terms, and we want you to join us. I think that, that, that is arguably one of, the, one of the most difficult challenges we're going to confront, but it's a very important one. Thank you. Joe? <coughs> Joe Bosco with the Ernie Bowers program here. Um, and this is a follow-up, actually, to Ernie's question. Uh, Mr. Minister, given the tragic history of the earthquake that struck your country recently, I wonder uh, how the efforts are going within the ASEAN Regional Forum for cooperation among foreign militaries, in particularly including a, the development of a standard of forces agreement. Has there been much progress in the past year on that? You're really asking the wrong minister on, on, on that one, but um, uh, I can say that from my sort of higher level understanding of it, very good progress uh, is being made. And uh, uh, our defence minister, Wayne Mapp, who's been here quite recently, has been very fully engaged in that work. Uh, and uh, I think that... Um, uh, the, the short answer to your question is uh, it's, it's all moving in a very positive direction. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Doug Hartwig, uh, the Mountain Institute. Uh, picking up on your comments of your discussions here in Washington the last couple of days, you noted that for TPP that you were encouraged by sort of an awareness or an engagement and interest and so forth. Um, and the the partnership study that was issued in Chicago, in, uh, in Christchurch um, in February spends on the economic dimension of it, places a high high emphasis also on TPP. From New Zealand standpoint today, what do you see to be the main hurdles, and 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 how can the United States and New Zealand work together to avoid to overcome them? Well, the uh, big hurdles uh, in these matters are always political in nature, um, and. Uh, I've got sitting in front of me Ambassador Mike Moore, who of course was the uh, uh, director of the World Trade Organization, uh, who should really be answering this question uh, for me. All, all I can say is that um, you know, there are a number of challenging political uh, decisions uh, confronting governments, but I believe that determination is there uh, to uh, ensure that we have a high quality uh, basis for moving forward. Uh, and can I say that um, uh, I am encouraged that while Japan has had a very significant setback uh, in recent times, that uh, in deferring uh, their own aspirations for TPP, it's been very much couched in terms of a postponement. 
And uh, there's been no resiling from the very challenging political debate in that country that um, Prime Minister Khan has, um, has kicked off. Um, so uh, I, I think we, we can see that um, those political challenges are being confronted uh, with some real leadership, actually. I think we have time for one more. Um, yes, in the back. Al Santoli, Asia American Initiative. Uh, Mr. Minister, I have a question about water levels and the impact of water. Australia has been going through some difficult times with the El Nino. Uh, other countries in the region are having either too much rain, not enough rain. Uh, two part, one is the impact in New Zealand, especially in your mountain, your snow caps in your mountains. Has there been any effect? And secondly, is in ocean water levels. How is that impacting neighboring island nations and also New Zealand's own coast? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think our experience, uh, and this is a purely anecdotal um, response in that sense. Um, our, our experience has been same uh, the same as many others that um, uh, that we've experienced both extremes. Uh, we were. We had a formal uh, official drought in Northland uh, in New Zealand just before Christmas and um, now the place is uh, the subject of pretty serious flooding and land slipping um, and it's been going on for, for some time. Uh, so, so clearly we have um, some challenges from, uh, from nature there. With regard to sea levels, um, uh, I, I take considerable interest in, in the debate, not, not particularly from a climate change uh, uh, perspective but because the there are decisions we have to make about how we're going to spend money in places like Tuvalu and Kiribati um, that require one to turn one's mind to, you know, how much the, the water is going to uh, undermine any uh, expenditure initiatives uh, that we engage in. Um, uh, there are there are some texts that uh, suggest that uh, at the same time the action of the, the tides is actually building up uh, some parts of uh, of the atolls as well. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. All I can say is that um, we are intent on uh, ensuring that uh, people on, on islands like Tuvalu and Kiribati, which um, some would say don't have a great future because of climate change, uh, are given every chance uh, to, uh, to establish a future. Uh, and hence my earlier comment about committing something like $30 million uh, into uh, in, into uh, to Kiribati over the next 12 months to do some quite signature uh, development work, uh, everything from sanitation to solid waste to roading uh, uh, to fresh water, um, which is a problem there. Uh, the airport uh, runways, two runways in fact, um, one in, one in Kiritamati Island, the other in uh, Ontario, that need to be resealed if they're to have uh, ongoing transport communication. So we're operate, operating on the basis that um, uh, these countries have got a future uh, and, and, and we're determined to see that that future is a significantly better one than their recent experience. Minister, thank you. We uh, have had, an, I think, an excellent discussion. It, it really reveals the breadth of our agenda, but, but also, at least for me, highlighted um, how much New Zealand is in the front lines of issues that are going to determine what kind of future we have in the Asia-Pacific region, from questions of whether we can engage China on development to whether or not we can create a trans-Pacific trade uh, framework. Um, so. I, I, we all, on both sides of the aisle, in and out of government, who care about the region, appreciate what you're doing um, and appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your thoughts with us today. Thank you. Thank you.